1987. You grew up in Shanghai in a two-bed flat with your parents and your grandparents. So, can you tell me what it was like growing up there, and how would your parents have described you as a child? Probably they would describe me as a naughty girl because I couldn't stop for even one minute. Since I have short hair most of my early years during my childhood, so I grew up, people will recognize me as a tomboy. So a bit naughty. Then that's when my parents decided to send me to the swimming school. They hoped that after two hours of swimming every day, I can be a quieter girl. So my parents will have a easier job to look after me. But I don't think that's the case. So even after two hours of swimming every day, they still find a nightmare to calm me down. <laughs> And you said that. You always had short hair. Was it your choice that you wanted short hair? Not really. I th think I would really like to have long hair. I don't know why my parents will never help me grow my hair. But my memory said to me, when I was little, I always used a skirt, like putting on my head and then pretending that I'm having the long hair. And、uh, later on, after five, when I started to swim. It's just impossible to have long hair because I think maybe the coaches suggest us not to. It will put much more trouble after swimming every day or even during swimming. But I see no problem for most adult swimmers or professional swimmers growing long hair. But I just don't know why. On one hand, I I remember I really want to be girly girl, but never got the chance to grow my hair. And then later on, after growing into the sailing school, the coaches had the same standard, saying we're not allowed to have long hair. It was not until after 15 when I finished my optimist class. And then transferring into the Olympic sailing class, that I started to grow my hair for the very first time at the age of 15. And I read as well that your dad could be quite emotional sometimes. And there was a point where your grandma and mom might have to call an ambulance because of certain incidences. I was quite surprised as a child. You even told your mom that maybe she should consider a divorce. And I thought, wow. You were really self-aware at that young age, and I wonder if you could share what was going through your mind then. I think for me, what's most important is the happiness and health of both my parents. But I just can't see that my mom can lead a happy life with my dad's character. When I was little, I can see how hurt my mother was, and that's why I was rather sacrifice having a proper family than to have my mom more happiness living by her own, or maybe find another guy. I wouldn't mind, but I just don't want to see them living together and hurt each other. That's why I would suggest her to divorce. Because what's the case in China is many couples are not happy together, but they would like to keep the relationship for their kids. But that's not the case for me. I don't want them to make do with life. So I want them to find their real other half and who they are really happy with. So I wouldn't mind. I have the people will gossip after me saying, "Oh, Lily's parents divorced, and Lily's growing up in a single parent family, etc." I wouldn't mind. All I want is just them to be happy and healthy. Was this single parent kind of household something that society then would have really frowned upon? Yeah, I think in China throughout my growing up. I didn't see a single couple that's truly in love with each other, which makes me don't believe love at all. It was not until when I met my husband that he proved me for years and years and made me believe in love. But just for the Chinese society, many people find their other half by friends or family introduced to what they thought to match each other, and they were just. Find the other half and make do with life because that's sort of like a task that you have to do at a certain age around twenty-five. That's really the case. What I see, many couples make do with life. They look after their parents as well as their kids. But looks like maybe things are much better nowadays for my generation because we have more freedom to choose who we want, and it's not such a big thing for not getting married or not having children, which is not the case in the past. 
And I understand that you had a pretty difficult time growing up because you were born with difficult hearing in both ears and also partially blind as well. And I understand that society really did not treat you kindly for that. Could you share a bit about what it was like growing up for you? I didn't realize I had this problem when I was little. It was not until after I went to the sailing team that I realized I'm different with, from the others. Whereas in the swimming team, I just find myself struggling hearing the coach's instruction. So for example, every time when we're doing the briefing before the actual training, I couldn't hear what the coach is talking about. So unaware of what the actual plan for the day of swimming. What I tend to do is just to lean my body and then trying to be a little bit closer to the coach and then to hear him or her, but still not able to comprehend 100%. So what I ended up was I would never swim leading the group. So even if I'm capable of being the first in the group, I tend to be in the second or third so I can follow the first of what our training contents are. So I just thought I want to keep swimming and then didn't realize anything unusual. But then later, after 10 years old, when I went into the sailing team, I realized more and more that I don't have normal hearing ability compared with other peers, especially, for example, my sailing coaches will repeat over and over again. And I misheard many things. So for example, one day my coach asked me to hold the tiller higher. And then in Shanghainese, it's very similar to put our belly out. So when I did my belly out, my coaches just burst into laugh. But later they bought a speaker, especially for me on the water, to help me understand a bit more but things are much more difficult on land because when I communicate with my peers instead of looking after me or carrying my shortage they make fun of me they would not repeat what they said if I didn't get them or didn't hear them they would just really make fun of me and gradually I become more and more shut to myself and couldn't really enjoy chatting with my teammates or playing together with them that's how I became more independent and then spend all the spare time in reading and studying by myself in a corner of a room so before we get into that, I understand that for you to start training in selling at the age of 10, there was this optimist coach, Zhang Jing, who found you and introduced you to the world of sailing while you were swimming. Could you share that story with us? In China, many sports would find athletes from the sport of swimming because that's the most popular one you got the most population in swimming so children start to swim at around five years old and then for other sports for example sailing coaches will think ah if i pick some athletes some sailors from the swimming team then more likely they are braver because they are not afraid of the water. They know they won't sink in on the water. So that's why the sailing coaches tend to select sailors in a swimming school. And then my first sailing coach, Zhang Jin, also picked up some sailors from the Shanghai swimming team. But the moment when she approached my parents, we just had no idea what sailing is because it's so unpopular in China at the time. 20-ish years ago. We've never seen that on television. We have no idea what that sport is. But after some demonstration from Zhang Jing, and then my parents asked me whether I would like to give it a try. I said, oh, why not? So that's how I started sailing in 1997. And my father drove me to the suburb of Shanghai and then started to learn sailing in a lake called Dianshan Lake. The training camp was two weeks long. There were about 50-ish kids training together. And then later on, I became one of the three girls selected to join the Shanghai sailing team. And what was the training camp like? Because it was your first time being on a boat, right? And was that boat called Optimus? Yeah. <laughs> The boat is called Optimus. I remember the first few times I boarded 
the boat. I still feel very afraid of the water, even though I know how to swim, because that's an unfamiliar sport. And then on a boat, you lost your balance, and you may be hit by the boom and or the sail. If it's windy, then we may capsize. At first, I'm not very brave as Zhang Jing thought would be. But gradually, I became more and more brave, and then started to enjoy sailing because it's so much more fun than swimming. Every day, every hour is different because we're dealing with the nature instead of in a indoor swimming pool. And so, when you heard the news that you were the top three who could enter the Shanghai Sailing Program, and you had to go back to your parents and tell them that, how were you feeling? How did your parents react? Probably at the time I was too small,、uh, too little to understand how my parents would feel. But since I'm the only child in the family, and then switching from swimming to sailing, there's a big difference because swimming I can study normally, and then after school I go to swimming for two hours, and then my parents will pick me up and go back home together. Where sailing, I have to travel with the team all year round, which means I won't be able to go home apart from once a year for about one or two weeks during the holiday after racing season. That's where my parents feel most unbearable. They weren't even allowed to see you, right? I think the entire career, they only watched you race once in person. Exactly, the team's like an army environment. It's all closed to the public, and then、um, nobody can visit us or can enter the team building. So yeah, my parents just can't bear sort of losing me from the age of ten. At that time, the communication or the technology wasn't that good, so we just communicate or keep in touch by letter once a week. It was not until I think for the first half a year when I travel with the sailing team, I almost cry every day. That's also the case for my parents. Because even though I find sailing is much more fun and interesting, and、uh, every day is different and, and intriguing in in sailing myself, but without my parents' love and care, it's just so uncomfortable. And I have to do everything by myself. So washing and making the room, cleaning the room, etc. Whereas at home, I'm just like a little princess. I don't need to worry about any of the chores or housework. Whereas in the team, I have to do everything from the age of ten. That's、yeah. pretty tough. Yeah, and I think they basically controlled everything you did, right? What you did, what kind of training, what kind of boat that you specialized in, and I think you weren't allowed to disagree or say no. There were consequences for that too. Yeah, that's what the Chinese environment like for sports team. I think we were taught to grow up in a way that we have to obey everything; otherwise, we will be punished severely. For example, we will. Be asked to run for a ten k, or being on the water for an extra two hours, like this sort of training punishment. So that's why gradually we lost our voice, we lost our imagination. We just had to follow up everything set by the coaches or the leaders. And then you started your international career in the nineteen ninety eight Asian Championships in Optimus, and you also joined your first World Championship, which. I understand was quite significant for you because they gave an unfair ruling, and you couldn't challenge it because you couldn't speak English then. I wouldn't say that's unfair. I would just say because I couldn't speak English, I couldn't demonstrate my situation better. Like there might be some misunderstanding about my demonstration transferred by my translator because the translator doesn't know anything about sailing, so she just used the everyday live English to translate our sailing specific. Terminology or language, which caused some misunderstanding. So that's what inspired me to learn English by myself, because I don't think I can bear any more misunderstanding in the future for my sailing career. From then on, I not only spend a lot of time learning English for the school, but also I I put more attention learning sailing specific English, which benefit a lot for later years. 
And how were you learning English? Was it through English programs or books? I learned English just by myself, and I use a textbook series called New Concept English, which is quite a classical British English textbook.、Uh, so every day I spend probably at least. Two to three hours after my training or before my training to learn English, and sometimes maybe a little bit more if we have a rest day or we couldn't sail due to the foul weather. And the way I study is from listening, reading, and reciting. So many people ask me, Lily, how you how you picked up the English, and I said, really, if you keep learning, and then you will taste the sweetness after some time. Maybe at first you need to have the self discipline to really be willing to give up everything. Thing else, chatting, playing games, watching television, or watching movies, etc. But later on, when you taste the sweetness of being able to understand what the foreigner is talking about, you can read a lot of English books to help your sporting career. Then gradually, you become automatic that you want to learn, keep learning, and keep improving. And I understand at the age of twelve, you actually narrowly escaped death when you were out training with your coach off the coast of Fujian. Could you share a bit about what happened that day? I think I've only trained in sailing for less than two years. During a winter training camp, one day occurred a very strong wind. I remember my coach just said, "Oh, don't worry. It's just a little bit dark due to cloudy weather, but the wind is not that big." And then. After we sail out to sea, we realized, wow, the winds kept increasing and increasing, and until at some point we couldn't really control the boat at all. Later, when the coach said to sailors, "Ah,、oh, let's go back home. Let's sail back to the beach," it was already a little bit too late. So the waves. So high that I can't see other boats that close to me. What is more, the coach boat capsized due to a big wave, meaning that we lost the last hope if we face anything in danger. So normally, if we we sailors are in danger, the coach boat will approach us and then save our lives by jumping onto the coach boat and just abandon the sailboat. But that time, when the coaches lost control of themselves, and then I can't see the land, I just feel it was the first time I was so close to death. Fortunately, none of our equipment had any problems on that very challenging day. After three or four hours, we safely sailed back to shore just before it gets completely dark. Wow, the waves that I understand it were like fifty-six feet high, so you couldn't even see to the other side. Were you not traumatized or think like, "Wow, I can't go back to sea anymore because I almost lost my life"? I think conversely, it makes me more determined to. Be a better sailor. Obviously, I couldn't tell the story to my parents because they would worry about me. But deep inside my heart, it makes me really more determined to improve my sailing skills and、uh, mastering all kinds of conditions of weather. At what point did the Olympics become not just a dream but a real possibility? Because this whole incident see happened in 1999, and by 2002, you already had. Won the world championships two times. Your national team ready to go to apply for Athens. So, at what point did you realize that you know what? I really have a real shot at going for the Olympics. Very first time it was in two thousand and two when I finished my optimist career by winning almost all the competitions. My eyes were firmly glued to the Athens Games, which means after a national championship, then I can enter the national team and then doing the trials the following year in two thousand and three in order to get a spot for two thousand and four. Unfortunately, when I was diagnosed with a tumor on my leg, I had to accept the operation and following by a whole year's recovery, which made me lost the chance to do the trials. So, in a way, I had to give up 
Athens Olympics due to injuries. So it was not until four years later for the Beijing Olympic campaign that I start to properly training for my very first Olympic Games. And I think you had to have the surgery then because the doctors worried that it could spread and you would have to amputate the legs. And that half year when you had to recover, did you think of giving up? Because it must have been excruciating, the pain, just learning to reuse your leg muscles. Yeah, it was like learning from a little baby. My legs couldn't bend properly. I had to press my leg, gradually increasing the bend angle. And never occurs to me to give up, even faced with such difficulties or challenges or setbacks. I think when we face more challenges, it's actually a golden opportunity to help us become stronger and a better person. During that half a year, one year recovering time, when I couldn't sell, it makes me want to sell more and also help me to realize that I was already truly in love with the sport of sailing. So in the past, probably I can say I like sailing, I enjoy sailing, but yet to say I love sailing. But then it was in 2002 and 2003 when I couldn't touch the sailboat that made me realize that, well, my life couldn't go on without sailing. So when I finally be able to go back to the team and train and sail again, I become really grateful for the opportunity to be with my sailboat and also cherish every single training session so that I can be a better and an all-round sailor for future events. What was it about sailing that you realized you loved so much and you could not live without? The freedom and the closeness to nature. I think because probably of my hearing loss, as well as some other disadvantages, sailing makes me feel equal to everyone else. And then also something I'm pretty good at So I feel sailing is really giving me the opportunity to show my potential as well as pursuing my dream and then enjoy it at the same time. And what was it like those next few years starting to go back to competitions again? I understand in 2005, you started racing the laser radio class thingies. How were those years like leading up to your first Olympics at Beijing? I first saw the laser radio in 2005. It was pretty late compared with other foreign sailors. That's after my national games. And then we all switched from Europe, which was previously the Olympic class. And then sailing the laser radio is quite different compared with Europe because I would say Europe is more ladylike, more elegant boat because it requires more techniques as well as the equipment adjustment. Whereas for laser radio, it's one design. Everyone using the same equipment. It's a pure test for your fitness as well as your techniques and tactics. In a way, we always feel we Asians not as strong as the Westerners. Like the Chinese always joke that because we having porridges every morning, whereas the Westerners having bread and butter, which has much higher calories and then giving more energy to our body. But talking back, yeah, I do find it very, very challenging to improve my fitness. We not only have to put in a lot of hours in the gym, but also on a bike in order to improve our aerobic endurance. My typical training routine would be something like two hours weight training in the morning, four to five hours on the water, and then two to three hours on the road bike. That's training, training all the time. And it was not until after putting many hours of fitness training that I was able to sail the boat fast enough in order to compete against my foreign rivals. And I understand in 2006, when you were 19, you decided to abandon your name, Lydia, and adopt the name Lily. Could you share with us that story? When I was in the primary school, the English teacher 
just sort of assigned English names to our students. And then Lucy started at that time, probably around age seven or so. And then later on, I just found, oh, Lucy is a quite out of date name, maybe for the older generation, not for my generation. And then I was looking for a new English name. But obviously my very first email address started with Lucy and I'm still using that email account. So every so often people were still confused with Lucy or Lily. Back in 2006, a friend of mine suggested that my Chinese name is Xu Li. Xu is my family name. Li is actually in English Lily. So she suggested, oh, why don't you change to Lily, which sounds a younger name compared with Lucy. So that's when I started to use Lily instead of Lucy from the year of 2006. And in 2008, you went finally to your first Olympics, the Beijing Olympics, and you won a bronze after racing at the Qingdao Regatta. What was that whole experience like for you? I think in 2008, due to my first Olympic experience, I was extremely nervous because everything is huge. The crowd, the attention, the cameraman, so different compared with any other event, not even for the world championship. Uh, They're not the same level. I think because I was feeling so much pressure, I couldn't perform myself to start with. But then gradually, after some adjustment, I changed my attitude or changed my psychology and enjoy the games instead of being beaten by the tension or the pressure of the games. Luckily, it was not too late to adjust because I think at the beginning I was very nervous and gradually become more normal and performed myself. Whereas my rivals, they are normal at the beginning and then gradually they become more nervous and then didn't perform well. So that's how we changed our position. I was very happy of winning that medal even though it was just bronze because everyone's expecting me to win a gold since I was the world champion in 2006 and then I've always been on the podium leading to the games but one thing many people don't realize was my sailing style isn't suitable for the venue of Qingdao where the sailing event was held so in the end I was very very happy about this result and my performance You said your style wasn't suited to that place. Could you elaborate a little bit more on why that was the case? I like light wing very much. In any other venue, I can always sell in the first group in light wing. Whereas in Qingdao, we have very light wing, but with big waves and strong current. And somehow I just couldn't have a good speed either in upwind or downwind, especially downwind. My feeling, the same sense of steering the boat isn't good enough. So I tend to lose dozens of boats in a downwind leg, which is very costly. None of other venues in the world will be like that. And how many races did you have to do? Well, for a sailing event, normally we have 11 races. So each race lasts about an hour. And every day we will do two races. So the sailing competition will last for about a week because we have days off in the middle as well. But if we miss the racing due to uh, challenging weather, we will use the day off to continue finishing 11 races. And then for the first 10 races, everyone will start together racing together, which is called the opening series. And then after 10 races, the top 10 boats will race in the medal race which will be double point. It's a double point system, whereas in the opening series, it's it's single point, meaning that if you finish the first, you add one point, and second add two points, whereas for the medal race, if you win, you will have two points, and second, finishing second, you will add four points, just to add a little bit more drama (laughs) for the final race. 
you had so many races over such a long period of time and you had to bear that pressure of everyone knowing who you were and expecting you to deliver. I imagine that the reason why you could settle in psychologically, emotionally into the race was because everything became normal for you. Because I interviewed another Olympian and she said, I was in synchronized swimming and we were in the final week of the Olympics. And initially I was like, so overwhelmed by everything. But then I was training every day and it was like a normal training week. And I got so used to it that we could settle into our role. It was just like any other day. Was that the same case for you? I think it's easier to say that than to do that. Yeah, of course, I would like to take it easy and then just treat it as a normal training week. But I think realistically, it's not that easy to do. But later on, I discovered the sports psychology, which helped me to deal with the pressure much, much better because we can do the meditation over and over again in our mind to make ourselves more mentally prepared for the big event. So I would definitely recommend a sports psychology or, or psychology in any area of our life because even though we can't see it, we can't touch it, but this inner strength is so powerful. It definitely can help us increase, uh, improve to another level or maybe just to perform ourselves under pressure in any way of life. And you were discovering all this while I understand you took a long break from sports straight after Beijing Olympics because they had this back injury. And in the process of learning more about sports psychology, is that how you discovered the book Be Your Own Selling Coach by your now husband, John Emmett? Yeah, I started to buy a lot of English books after 2008, not only sailing books, but also nutrition ones, psychology, as well as fitness training. I just read a lot of books during my break after Beijing Games. And then later on, when I utilized all these knowledge into my own sailing and training, I become a much better athlete in all ways. So eating more purposefully in a nutritional way in order to fuel my training better. And also using psychology training before and after each training session so that I can have a clear aim before the session, during the session, and afterwards I can do a better sum up, just like a replay the movie in my mind. For fitness training, also the same, that I can train more effectively and efficiently with some more scientific method. Those knowledge are so powerful that helps me to reach another level in my sporting career. And I wonder what it was about that book, Be Your Own Sailing Coach, that struck you so much because you really wanted to get John to be hired to coach the sailors in China and they were not happy about it, right? You really had to fight for it. Yeah, I think uh, John and Matt's Be Your Own Sailing Coach was just one of the books that I really enjoy. And then since I learned he's living in Weymouth where the Olympics will be held for 2012, and then he's an actor expert in laser radio which is my olympic class then i think it would be really a blessing if the chinese team could hire him as our coach but to start with they are not very into him for various reasons and then it was not until later on when the leaders and coaches actually see how much progress I had training together with John, that they finally agreed and signed a contract with him leading to the 2012 Olympics. But it was still difficult, right? Because even at the London Olympics, he wasn't even allowed into the athletes' village. So you were communicating via text. Yeah, because there are limited accreditation cards for each team. My Chinese coach got the first opportunity. So he's allowed to enter the village as well as being on the water with me but then John didn't have the chance to coach me properly so what we did was he texted me and emailed me all the time and giving me suggestions or instructions and then the weather briefing and after racing we will meet outside the village and then just do some easy aerobics in the gym that's when we can talk a little bit face to face but other times we just communicate by text email by the electronics 
I imagine that going into the London Olympics must have been very different experience from Beijing because John was using such a different method. And I read in your book, Golden Lily, that he would always say for a year leading up to the London Olympics that one day you'll wake up and it's 30th of July. And that was like constantly in your mind. So you were mentally prepared for that date. Yeah, exactly. He started to mention this a long time ago. So I won't be overwhelmed like the Beijing Olympics, completely out of control by the nervousness. Whereas because he kept emphasize on the upcoming London Olympics, he helped me mentally more prepared for that big event of my life. And then just trying to treat it as a normal training week as we mentioned earlier i would say without his suggestion or without some psychological training it won't be possible i'm very glad that i managed to deal with it in an easier way so that i can perform on the pressure during the london olympics and he also said a lot about joy right right before your final race you told the media that i'm going to give it all for joy with all of my heart And do you feel that joy as you were racing? What was that final race like for you? Yeah, it was very competitive because all the top four sailors had the opportunity to win a gold medal in the last medal race. I've went through in my mind for hundreds and thousands of times. So even though I can see a lot of cameramen and a lot of media attention, as well as people messaging me from all over the world, I just treat it as a golden opportunity for me to perform and act myself yeah I imagine myself as an elegant actress so that I can give my best performance to the whole world and I won't leave any regret for my life and at the first downwing lake for that race you actually had to do a penalty turn did that make you panic or were you just I'm just going to execute it and continue the race Yeah, I was, first of all, mentally prepared for any accidents because before the race, we try to meditate what we are going to react if this problem works or that problem occurs. And then when I was whistled of that penalty, I just immediately doing the turns to exonerate myself and then focus back into my downwind sailing again. So I didn't wander about or I didn't worry much about this penalty. I just want to really concentrate on my own sailing. And um, as prepared, mentally rehearsed before, just I want to give my best performance to the world. Was there any particular moment at the Olympics that touched you personally? the moment when I finishing in the medal race because for my character I'm a pretty quiet girl I don't shout or I don't talk loudly but after I finish I couldn't help screaming loud enough to let the whole broadcasting team hear and even the audience can hear my shouting on the sea so it's just a very natural expression of my mood feeling wow I finally realized my dream and then giving my best performance to the whole world and making the Chinese sailing into history, etc. Because you were China's second ever Olympic gold in sailing. So that was huge for yourself and also for the country. Yeah, as we mentioned earlier, like sailing in China isn't very popular. And then it was not until 2008 when sailing was held in Qingdao of Shandong province that our sport get some extra attention because it was held in another city other than Beijing. Beijing, yeah, my teammate in Jian won the windsurfing gold medal. And then four years later, when I carried on to win another gold medal in sailboat dinghy, people not only get to know about sailing, but they want to pick up and to learn sailing themselves. So that's when more and more Chinese go into the sailing clubs and then learn properly about how to sail. For those four years, a lot of marinas were built and sailing clubs were developed. So the Chinese had more opportunity to to learn sailing as well. Because for my country, my nation, we have a long coastline. We really want to make the most of it. And you were also China's flag bearer for the closing ceremony. Was this something that I think you discovered on the day itself? 
Yeah, I was still in Weymouth on the closing ceremony day. And then in the early morning, I got a phone call saying that, Lily, please get onto the car and then head to London because there are three hours car journey between Weymouth and London. And then uh, my team leader said to me, are you being selected as a flag bearer? But please don't tell anybody else. Just, oh, oh, okay, really? I can't believe it. But anyway, later on, when I went into the actual, the proper athletes village, Olympic village in London, that I started to feel, wow, that's how Olympics should feel like. Because in Weymouth, just as sailors and sailing teams, whereas in London, you can meet all different people from different sports, different country. Yeah. And you got a 24 hour dining room huge dining room i remember on the actual closing ceremony day there were another six sailors selected as a flat bearer which make us sailors feel pretty proud of our sport also my father joked to me that i had no problem to sleep on the day when you win a medal but i really had the insomnia when i learned that you're a flat bearer because for in china we have something like 50 gold medalists in london olympics whereas there's only one black bearer the whole nation learned about my names even my father felt so proud of that special moment and what was it like suddenly being the center of all this media attention it was pretty overwhelming but i just treat the opportunity as a golden one to promote sailing because instead of thinking about myself i think about the sport because i want more chinese people to feel the joy of sailing so with those extra attention from the media i always kept talking about sailing instead of just talking about me my own story And was it hard for you to announce that you were retiring from the sport soon after the London Olympics? So I carried on for another year for the National Games, which was held at the end of 2013. And then I decided to fly to the UK for my study as well as learning some other sailing history, you know, maritime rich history country. Personally, I would like to carry on with my sporting career. But just the fact that I had too many injuries, which stopped me from training intensively. And then after one or two years in the UK, I just fully focused on my study and then a bit easier on my fitness training. I still do train every day, but much, much lighter load. And then in the summer of 2015, I felt, oh, my body is pain-free. Maybe I can do another campaign. So that's when I started to do my third Olympics. And you have described your third Olympics, the Rio Olympics in 2016, as your most enjoyable as well. Yeah, from Beijing, I was most nervous. To London, I started to master or balancing the pressure in a more mature way. And then to the third Olympics, I just really, really want to grasp and then enjoy every second of it. Because it's only for once every four years opportunity. And then maybe my sporting career will end at a certain age because we can't really compete as other career for the rest of our life. Though I agree or often introduce to the public that sailing is a lifelong sport, but maybe for the competitive one, it's not as easy as other career. But I would still like to say, even though I didn't manage to do it, to compete in sailing or doing some professional sailing in my 40s or 50s as other foreign sailors do, but I would still say to the public that sailing is really a great sport that you can enjoy for your whole life. You may even be able to race together with a world champion or an Olympic champion because we will go to some events that the public can do as well. I think for some other sports, it's almost impossible for the amateur sailors or for the public to race against world-level sailors. So is it right to say you're never too old to pick up sailing? Yes, exactly. And after Rio, did you have the intention to go for your fourth Olympics? 
I was super determined to do the Tokyo Olympics, especially after Rio, even though I didn't get a good result, but I just enjoy it so much. I want to recover from my injuries and then trying to do another one. But unfortunately, even after two operations on my shoulder, I still had pain and couldn't train intensively, which makes me feel a bit sad and pity. But then also because of this, I think when the guard shut one door, it may open another window. So I, I try to look for a second op other than sailing and compete myself and then ended up doing the sports media now. Before you entered media, I think you were considering other things as well, like translating, coaching, being a team leader. How did you go through all that and land on media? When I was in the team, I always started to imagine what my future career would be like if I couldn't sell anymore one day in the future. All these job title pops up my mind because that's something I'm capable of doing. But then later on, I think media fits my dream better, especially after I won gold. I have my own IP. I can keep influencing to the next generation, to the public, and then continue my influential power to to influence people into the sport of sailing and then use my knowledge to do sailing reports for the Chinese, as well as passing on the knowledge to the next generation. By doing media, I I can reach to more people for my dream. Whereas if I just work in a team or work in a corporation, we'll only be able to influence people around me or in that organization. Whereas doing media, I can definitely reach to more population and then share the idea of happy sailing. And was it difficult for you to enter into this new area or this new career? Because you used to be the one being interviewed, now you are interviewing. Oh, I would say, of course, it's very challenging as a newcomer in media because when I was little, I'm not that talkative because of my hearing and I couldn't communicate equally with other people. So that's when I started to become a quieter girl after picking up media, meaning I need to talk more actively and then in a different role, in a more proactive role, asking people questions. There are challenges, but so far, after three years of exploring this new career, I couldn't have enjoyed it more. Yeah, I think I will carry on with this career and then trying to promote sport for a greater amount of people. What have been the most surprising things that you learned while doing this media or unexpected things? One of the things I really enjoy is meeting many new friends, many new people, whether elite sailors or successful athletes in other sports. So I not only do sailing reports, but I also interview uh, world champion or champion in other sports in China, making videos. And yeah, I just so enjoy talking to them and then sharing their story to more people so that not only the younger generation can be inspired by their optimistic attitude, but also the adults can be lured into a healthy life by doing more exercise. And you also have a podcast as well, a monthly one, where you feature your friends from all over and talk about their sport. I have a Chinese podcast which update once a week by interviewing all the elite athletes in China. And then also I have a monthly updated podcast in English that's mainly interviewing sailors. And you can listen to it even if you are not a sailor, no problem. So those are the two podcasts I'm doing. You can find it on Apple, Google Podcasts or any platform like Spotify or SoundCloud. I mean, clearly you have found something that you love doing after being an elite sports athlete. You've been training your whole life, this is all you know, and then you have to retire. And what do you do with the rest of your life? Is this something that is a common struggle? 
Yeah, very, very common. Everyone has that period of transition or in a sudden we lost the ability to do something we're really good at it and then into a new society and then doing something we're not good at it at all. So mentally, we need to be prepared or facing that challenging positively and then also trying to keep studying, keep improving and with our athlete's attitude, I believe we, we can also act excellent in other career other than sport and I think you're part of the renewal program charity that helps athletes to make that transition is that correct yeah I'm involved in a charity program to help athletes transferring better or more smoothly from sporting career to their future career It involves uh, a series of courses in order to teach us athletes how to better master in our future career, how to communicate with the society, be involved fully instead of feeling overwhelmed for a new environment. So yeah, I would like to help more Chinese athletes make a smoother transition for their future career and then reach their best in the future as well. And we are recording this at the end of 2020. Obviously, the whole world went through this thing called COVID-19. We still are. How has that impacted your life and your career? First of all, it affected my travel because my husband British and then normally I would spend one month in China, one month in the UK. So I can have frequent visit to both sides. Whereas now due to COVID, if I travel from one country to the other, I will lose one month quarantine time, which make my travel much less frequent. So for this year, I spent the first half of the year in the UK and almost the second half in China. And then probably the next time I go back to China will be in June 2021 and then for my work since I spent such a long time in the UK continuously the many of my work will have to be done online and then once I go back to China just really busy with the actual offline work so my life's completely different in both countries I hope we can passing this pandemic fairly soon and wishing the Tokyo Olympics can be held on time because you're going to be a media reporter at the Tokyo Olympics right Yeah, I got the accreditation card from Ward Sailing to be a sailing-specific reporter. And then the sailing event will be held in Enoshima, Japan. And hopefully through my media work, more Chinese can learn about the competition of sailing. Also, some Chinese windsurfers may have the ability to win a medal. It's just a matter of what color. And so you're doing all these things in you know, a podcast, writing articles. You also have a book. Can you share with us a bit more about your book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have two books, one in Chinese, teaching people how to learn sailing. And then the other one in English is more an autobiography, sharing my life stories and sailing stories. You can order it online on Amazon or ebook. This English autobiography, I've told stories about my family, my background, my sporting career, both in swimming and sailing, as well as my Olympic journey. So a lot to explore in the book. And then I'm sure you'll get more excitement or touching moment in that book. Do you think that there is anything that you would have done differently if you could go back to the past? Yeah, one thing pops up my mind immediately is if I can train more scientifically instead of overtrain, then I can extend my sailing career a bit longer. Because really, even though however much I enjoy doing media work now, nothing can compare with sailing and compete myself. So do train more scientifically, do improve your core and then uh, avoid overtraining. What do you believe that most people don't? For my hearing loss, because I only have half the ability of ordinary people, actually, even though in the past, when I was little, I complained a lot, saying why the God is so unfair to me, that I don't have the similar hearing ability as other people. But now I actually think 
being lost to half of my ability helped me to reach the level I'm at now because I'm more focused in my sailing career. I'm more focused in studying, whereas my peers probably spend more time a bit wasting on some other entertainment. So from the face value, people would think oh, it must be so sad to lose half of the hearing ability. But I, I I'm, couldn't have been more grateful of what I'm able to do now. Is there anything that people listening to this interview can help you with? So if you are talking to me, try to grab my attention. Let me look at you before you speak. Because if you speak behind me on the side, I probably really struggle to understand you. Whereas if you grab my attention and talking directly towards me, I can uh, understand you better together with the lip reading. For those who want to be elite athletes, do you have one big piece of advice for them? Read a lot of sports-related books, whether that's psychology, fitness, nutrition, or even other sports people's autobiography will help you deal with your challenge much better. Is there any particular book or person that you would recommend? Sorry, I would like to recommend a, a sailor's book, which is Ben Ansley's Close to the Wind. He won four gold medal and one silver medal in the five Olympics. And he's now campaigning for the America's Cup in New Zealand, Auckland. And you've often been compared to the China version of Ben Ansley as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One of the most memorable sentences I remember in Ben Ansley's book was, any event I go to, my rivals only have the opportunity to fight for a second, meaning that I'm always the strongest, the best sailor, and then no one can compete with me for gold. They are only having the opportunity to compete for a second. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Lily, for this time. I have Really enjoyed talking to you. I normally end all my interviews with these questions. So the first one is, do you think that you have found your why? Oh, yes. I feel very lucky to meet my beloved sailboat. Not only personally, I enjoyed every second on a boat. It also helped me realize my dream, my value, and showed my potential. What is more, the current career I'm doing now still related to sailing, to sport, and related to my dream to promote sailing in China. And hopefully it can become more popular in the future in China. And what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? I want to leave a legacy of more and more teenagers having the opportunity to learn sailing. So I'm thinking about having a school so more people can learn and pick up sailing. And then even when they are passed away, the legacy can carry on. And what do you think are the most important qualities a successful person should have? Be optimistic. And then whenever you face some challenge, try to open your eyes and find the positive side of it. And then once we go through those setbacks, we realize how much we've grown, how much we've improved. And where can people go to connect with you and find out what you're doing and support your work? For Western social media, you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter just by searching my name, Shuli Jiao Li Jia Shu. And then for Chinese people, I have Xinlang Weibo, or WeChat. You can also find me, follow me by searching my Chinese name, Shuli Jia.